All right. So here we are, just three of us today. Uh, Liz is not here, but we will charge on regardless. So Urban has got WireGuard. WireGuard is now coming to Android as default. It's been in uh, mainline Linux for a while, right? It has been in mainline Linux, but it hasn't made it to Android until now. Oh. So, well, it's very nice. I, I tell my students to start using it uh, for classes, and it really is nice. You can have a local machine, a cloud machine, a nice VPN connection, and it seems super secure. There's a private key at both ends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that is the one pot, uh, one advantage it has over OpenVPN, because OpenVPN, you can't do that. Yeah, and OpenVPN is sort of hard to set up. This one here seems to be very reliable, runs on every OS, easy to set up. So now it, it's showing, it will be showing up in Android too as, as default, which is awesome. Actually, that's better because, I mean, I canceled my VPN commercial contracts because I'm just at home. Where you really need a VPN is on your mobile device, where you're taking it all these crazy places. Yep. Yep. And I now that it's default, that, that'll definitely help everybody else who's, who will be out and about once we get back to that point. Yeah, I guess that'll be about a year. Yeah. Anyway. Which is good, because this is, it'll come out in Android 12. And right now right. we are in Android 11. So, but when, the right when is Android 12 coming out? Do they know? I, off the top of my head, I don't know. But I'm thinking it'll come out just as we are returning back to normal. Is it on the iPhone too? I don't know if it's on the end. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know either. But anyway, I guess it will be. All right, so, oh, this one was fun. Copy so yeah, this is this is good, clean fun. Um, so you and, and yeah, don't copy and paste into a shell. So a lot of sites like Stack Overflow, you might have answers in the form of of shell script. And this is just a reminder: don't copy and paste from a web browser into a shell because it is very easy to add a little bit of JavaScript. You can see it in that gray so box at the bottom. There, and when I paste, it's something different. So that's right, different. exactly. And it, all it takes is that little bit of JavaScript in that gray box in order yeah. to completely change what you copy. So if you were disabled JavaScript in your browser, it would stop it, but of course nobody would do that. Yeah. Right. That's cool, yeah, neat. I, I, I don't know why this, this is a, a thing that is by default and they don't warn you about because I know there are some websites that they have you know copyrighted content and they use it to stop you from copying but you would yeah. think that there would just be an API for no copy but there's an API in JavaScript for just replace everything with whatever I want okay it seems like you know the browser is now warning you about cross-site scripting it seems like the browser ought to warn you about this yes. hey, dude, what you just copied isn't what you think it was yeah you would think you would think it would warn you they, they don't Yep, that's good. <laughs> There's another similar one I've seen, which is um, uh, pseudo su dollar sign curl, which I think is still the official way to install something important like Docker, where you just take something from the web and run it in this administrator right there without even seeing yeah. it. Yes. Yeah, I think it's still that way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, supposedly what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to wget it and check the SHA-1 and then of run course. it. But there's a lot of things. Like I noticed uh, the pie hole. They're like, how to install it? Run. Uh, curl, website, pipe, sh, like, uh, okay. <laughs> well, it's always the same. I mean, you say, let's make it easier. People don't want to go through all that extra work. Yeah. Well, security won't, doesn't really matter. Nobody would do anything bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's just get people in the, in the habit of downloading and copying uh, scripts directly into, in, their, in their terminal. What, what could possibly go wrong? And another thing that I thought was pretty cool was in that exploit, but when I tried it before, is evil updates where it pops up like a Java box. It is, oh, time to install this. Elevate your administrator to install this stuff. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. I don't see that used that much anymore, but it was all the rage for a while. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the big problems with Vista is that there were so many warnings like, do you, do you want administrator privileges to do this? Do you want administrator privileges? Okay. People just got in the habit of just clicking yes. So yeah. what's the point? Yeah. I know that's true of the, of the family members to ask me for help. These boxes pop up. They don't know what they are. They just swap them away like flies. And then when they have enough trouble, they call me. My machine doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't do anything. <laughs> anyway, uh, all right. So, so I'm kind of worried about this. Uh, America arrested some Chinese people. So China says they're going to retaliate by detaining American students there which is the kind of stuff we did in the Cold War with Russia. We would grab some people, they would grab some people, and I was you know, sort of connected to the physics community and people that were held in prison for years in Russia uh, and, and accused of being spies and, 
maybe they were spies and maybe they weren't, but man, if this is going to keep on, I'm not going to be able to go to like China or DEF CON China if it happens again. So that's pretty weird. But they point out, of course, with something which I don't imagine is any surprise, is that Chinese law totally makes this legal. And there's new laws out there. They're changing the laws to have a bunch of these vague crimes where it would, uh, they could accuse us of stealing commercial copyrighted stuff. Boy, that's kind of a hoot. <laughs> and uh, so on. So it would be very easy for them to trump up one of these charges against anybody they wanted to hold. So it's kind of nerve wracking. Looks like we're headed into another cold war with China. Fun. Anyway, the Raspberry Pi module. Yes, the Raspberry Pi module is out. And it is uh, better because, for example, it has PCIe. You don't have to do some weird soldering and figuring out. The, they have a picture of the board. So uh, you add a second board to it? Oh, yeah. You, can always, you could always do that with the other. There's compute modules, which are different from the standard Raspberry Pis. So it's uh, like a this, math process. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Well, the idea is, like, let's say you're, you're designing a laptop and you don't want a big, bulky uh, Raspberry Pi you can install the compute module instead. And then all those pins at the bottom will connect to things like USB and PCI and stuff. So. Mm -hmm. It's also connected to a Raspberry Pi, right? Yeah, or you can set up a cluster. Oh, OK. Yeah. So you yeah. can add multiple compute modules to the one Pi controlling it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and this, this version now comes with uh, PCIe, okay. which is something new. All the Should prior compute modules did not have that. So you can make a stronger computer for a tougher job. Right. So we can, you can attach uh, other cards now. This oh, yeah. is minus USB 3.0. I'm not entirely sure that's a good, good trade-off. Because I'd probably just use the PCIe just to add more USB 3. OK. So what, what kind of stuff could you build with this that you couldn't build before? Well, you can now attach like a graphics card. It didn't used to have one? Good, no. Because there wasn't there wasn't a PCIe slot. Oh yeah, no, yeah. there is. I okay. So you could have like gamer quality graphics. Right. Okay. Yeah. Or you know attach uh, other other things through PCIe. Okay, sounds cool. All right, and then cellular service on the moon. Oh yeah, I saw this one. So finally, finally, we're getting cellular service on the moon. Uh, unfortunately, oh. it's just it's just four uh, G, um, four G, not not five G. Uh, <laughs> so there's no five G on the moon yet, but we will have four G, and so hopefully that will be good enough for the short term. So we're gonna oh. have we're gonna have better signal on the moon than we do here in the U.S. You know that's that's entirely possible because one the moon, you know there's very little obstructing signals on the moon. Right? There's very little atmosphere. There's little getting in the way. You just put it on the top of a large crater mountain, and yeah. you just get signal all over the place. Um, and then, yeah, I, I mean, OK, so jokes aside, this is really more about research and just showing that it can be done. Because one of the things that's going to start happening is we're going to start m moving people to the moon long term. And they need to communicate with each other. And I guess instead of having a custom solution of you know, radio transmitters and stuff, we're going to start having, we're just going to just use existing 4G cellular infrastructure. OK, great. Hold on. Um, Long term, I mean, isn't it a pretty unhealthy place to be? Yes, it is unhealthy. Um, unfortunately, you know, getting there takes a week. Yeah. Getting back takes a week. It's going to be, I imagine, and I don't have any proof to back this up, but I imagine when we start launching from the moon, Going to the moon is going to be kind of like the next international space station where people will stay up there for like six months at a time. They're going to get a lot of radiation though, right? Oh, they will. They'll have to be shielded. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Um, if you go to the dark side, then I guess you wouldn't have much radiation. Yeah, the dark side would have less radiation. And, and it, it's a better launch site anyway. Oh, wait a minute. No, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. The radiation comes from the sun. Right. And, and that, well, right. Oh, wait, that's right. That's right. It doesn't matter what side because it's... You keep it's, moving, so... Yeah, you keep moving. It doesn't matter. You're going to get radiation regardless. So, yeah. um, but no, at the poles. Yeah. Poles, you're going to have less radiation. But, um, but yeah, so they're, they're doing this. They're just setting up a communication channel. But that brings up a point that, that our internet is now extending way off world. 
Right. It's and, cool. and, you know, we used to have to deal with lag of, a, you know, a few milliseconds, you know, maybe 100 milliseconds if it's really bad, uh, 200 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be a 200 ping, uh, sorry, a two second ping lag at the best between right. Earth and the moon. Right, because it's so eight and a half minutes of light to the sun. So, right. It's two seconds. To, two two, seconds to the, the moon, right. It's one second to there, one second back. Yeah, so that'll be about like a lot of home Wi-Fi, really. Oh, well, maybe, but it, it it's still something to think about as we as we extend our network out to yeah. the moon and beyond. Is that how do we deal with these large lag times? Well, there's delay tolerant networking, as you know. There's already a protocol for that. There is, yeah, yeah. The yeah. internet's not not really designed around using it, but you could always have like relay servers or something that. I figure like the ISS might be a relay. It's well, yeah. no, the ISS is so close that it, they don't need any. There's hardly any. Well, lag. I mean, from the moon to Earth, it, yeah, it's all well. Oh, go on. The ISS is essentially already on Earth. Yeah, yeah it's already on Earth, but it's also going to be on the wrong side of Earth half the time. Yeah. So, uh, we, yeah. so when are they going to start putting people up there? Is it I, 10 years I have out no idea. Years out? Yeah. I'm like maybe 20, but it's it, this is like I said, this is not a serious project. This is just a proof of concept. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. But yeah. yeah. And uh, so this one, I thought this was stupid, but then I saw it was from MIT, so I decided to pay attention. And I find it's actually a pretty good idea. I thought of the same thing. So if you have AI, you teach it by looking at hundreds of thousands of samples and it learns the pattern. And yet, why do you need so many samples? And what these guys did, they took a known case where you have like the digits written all different ways and you're trying to learn to recognize the numbers. And they said, instead of having thousands of samples, just refine what the important differences are and only look at these images and you can then categorize those. So these are like difference maps. And then they said, you don't even need 10 difference maps to learn to discriminate 10 symbols. You can do it with as little as two or even one. And they call this less than one trial learning. And it makes sense because the amount of information in one image here is much bigger than one bit. So if you, that uh, easy example is if you try to tell apples from oranges and you measure the weight and the color, the apples, the green apples are here and the red apples are there and the oranges are up here. So if you just look at the color alone, there's an overlap. If you look at just the weight alone, there's an overlap. But if you were to just graph this correctly, you could make a single graph where there's just a line and the apples are all on one side and the oranges are all on the other. So you really only need one learning example hmm. to do a good job of sorting it. And this is where I think we're moving into something that, because the one thing about AI, the only way you make a computer play chess is you'd make an algorithm. Uh, calculate how many points there are for every piece and figure out which one gives you more points and always take that move or something. And the new way is you just show it chess and tell it if you win or lose and it has to try millions of times to learn. And you really ought to combine the two. You ought to give it something smarter to look at, which you have carefully designed to include the useful information and then have it learn on that. So I think this is a real step forward. Um, and AI may get much smarter using this kind of thinking. Anyway, so that it's a little more uh, front heavy. We're providing yeah. some info already, and then uh, yeah, but that's the idea. You want to guide it with the information that humans have to make the job more efficient, and then have AI add the part that it makes up. So gotcha. it sounds. I I I think this might really be powerful. Anyway, and then we got uh, JScript, which is not JavaScript. It's something else, right? Right. Right, it's been around since in IE3 in 96. I've never used it. What it was it deprecated for? in IE8 in 2009, but it's actually still been around. No surprise, because, you know, Windows. It's, it reminds me of VB script, which is also gone now, I think. Yeah. Microsoft made all these, it's like, it's like Silverlight. They made all these imitations of other things and lost. Yep. Yep, so there's, there's a couple of CVEs out for this. And there's instructions on how to disable it, uh, yeah. but uh, yeah, it's coming out in the in the October patch Tuesday. Yeah, so obviously you want to get rid of it. I'm sure it's not used for anything legitimate. Right, right. Yeah. It's not used anymore, and it's a vulnerability that needs to go away. Of course, yeah. Okay. And uh, Google's going to sell Chrome. Or well, they might be forced to. You. Oh, right. I heard about this. Yeah, so there are expectations of an imminent antitrust action by the U.S. Justice, Justice Department uh, and the EU uh, about Google, Chrome, and Google. And basically, the, there's some concern that Google has too much power in the market 
and they want to force Google to sort of sell Chrome, which, you know, it is kind of weird because it's already an open source product, essentially. Like there's a, there's just that Google part at the top, you know, that's, that's Chrome, but it's, most of it is Chromium. Um, yeah. So if they just get rid of it, it just, I guess we'll just be using Chromium instead. Well, but I guess the point is they push Google services by yes. uh -huh. the default search engine and stuff. And that just like, they probably don't want them to tie it to their search. Exactly. And the same thing happened with Microsoft and Internet Explorer back in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. That's right. The logical split for Microsoft there was to separate Office from Windows. Right. And, and I've heard um, Scott Galloway is always talking about this. This seems to be the modern belief that we'd have a much better tech ecosystem if we broke up these giants. Mm -hmm. And uh, breaking them up according to some logical business selection would make sense, like the search separate from the browser. Right. Right. Yeah, well, and I guess it's going to happen because it looks like Biden's going to win, and presumably he'll put uh, Elizabeth Warren someplace up there, and she'll start doing this stuff. But keep in mind, this isn't just a U.S. issue. Right. The, the European Union is also looking at this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. But I, but you know, I think the EU is a pretty small player, really. I think Google could afford to just write off the EU <laughs> from a financial yeah. point of view. I think the only thing that really matters is America and China from the viewpoint of making money. Right. Right. Anyway, so uh, then we got, uh, I thought this would sound pretty good. Microsoft has data loss prevention on their server products, and now they're adding this to their client products. And what it does is if you're viewing something and you decide to copy it, it won't let you copy it. So this action is blocked. What you're trying to copy there was proprietary. And has a bunch of engines to recognize uh, this is social security numbers. This has the trademark on it. This is like customer data. So you can't just casually put it in a field and stuff. It sounds actually pretty good um, to stop people from leaking stuff out. Reminds me of Microsoft's anti-ransomware thing where you can define a folder and say only one program is allowed to change the files in this folder. Like Microsoft Word, random ransomware can't encrypt them, which is another pretty good idea. Right. So as long as you're using the Microsoft ecosystem, you'll be able to take advantage of this at your endpoints. Yeah. And of course, this means your boss could push it out through group policy to everybody. And now nobody can casually copy company data and put it somewhere stupid. It sounds like a win to me. Yeah. Yeah, actually. Yeah. All right. And are there any more comments? Maybe that's it. Yeah. Without Liz, it's just so quiet and right? desolate. I know. We need I know. Liz. I know. There's so much less argument and stuff. <laughs> I'll stop it.